We're wandering through the French Quarter, maybe feeling a little smug, like, hey, look at me, appreciating history, when suddenly the vibes just change. And you start thinking to yourself, hey, did I just wander into a horror movie and somebody forgot to tell me? The ghosts in the French Quarter are not the boo and poof kind. They got dedication. They got commitment. They've been haunting this place since Andrew Jackson was relevant, and they got an attitude. One minute you're enjoying your gumbo, the next there's a ghost shooting you the side eye like a turf. So you want to do a little urban hiking through the United States most haunted neighborhoods? Well lace up those hiking boots and join me as we hit 10 of the Bucure's most haunted hotspots. The Hotel Monteleon is like New Orleans and Hotel Farm. It's been around forever and it's got that blend of old school glamour and spooky vibes that just works. This iconic French Quarter landmark, draped in bro arts elegance, is a glittering time capsule of southern charm. Step inside and you're greeted by the grand chandeliers and opulent interiors that have seen over a century of wild parties literary inspiration, and more than a few brushes with the supernatural. Instagram famous Carousel Bar is the star of the lobby, slowly rotating as patrons sip cocktails and imagine the great writers of the past pulling up a stool next to them. It's easy to picture Hemingway with a brooding gaze, whiskey in hand, mulling over his next novel amid the dim lights. But let's be honest, while the drinks and glamour are enticing, Many visitors come hoping for a more unearthly experience. The Monteleon's resident ghosts are as much a part of its fabric as its luxe velvet curtains. First, there's Red, a dedicated former employee who just can't seem to clock out, even after death. Red has been spotted roaming the halls, tending to unfinished business like a spectral concierge, showing that some jobs really do last an eternity. But it's the story of Maurice Bidra that sends shivers down spines. Maurice was a young boy who tragically died on the hotel's 14th floor. Well, technically the 13th floor, but in true superstitious fashion, the hotel has renumbered it. Guests frequently report hearing the giggles of a child when no one is around, or seeing a small boy darting around corners, his laughter echoing in the eerie quiet of the night. And it's not just Maurice. The 14th floor has become a ghostly playground with reports of other children in vintage clothing appearing and disappearing in the blink of an eye, leaving a chill in the air as they go. Stay here long enough and you may not just get a night's rest, you may get an encounter with those you've never quite checked out. Some guests have woken up with the sound of playful laughter in the dark or found their belongings and mysteriously moved around the room. For those in search of the paranormal, the Monteleon offers a rich history and a chance to brush elbows with spirits, both living and not. Uh, yeah. Are you from New Orleans? Yeah. Are you from I New Orleans? Know. I am born and raised in New Orleans. My name is Kimani. Definitely come down here. They have awesome places you can go to, like the Jackson Square Lavere. We also have good food at my job. So All right. definitely come here. We will and definitely come nice here. Day. Thank you so bye, much. Bye bye. bye. So you're hiking down Charter Street, maybe feeling the weight of all that history around you, and suddenly you hear classical music spilling out from a building that looks like it's been around from the dawn of time. Napoleon House is a bar and restaurant that feels like it has been steeped in centuries of New Orleans lore, with every corner oozing history. The weathered, century-old peeling paint tells a story in itself. The faded walls lined with vintage photographs capturing the city's past in black and white. You can almost feel the weight of time pressing down on you once you step inside, as if the building itself is alive with the memories of the people who have walked through its doors. The legend of Napoleon House is as grand as the bar's atmosphere. In the early 1800s, Nicholas Sherrod, then the mayor of New Orleans, offered his home as a potential hideaway for none other than Napoleon Bonaparte. 
The idea was to rescue the exiled emperor from his imprisonment on the island of Elba and smuggle him into the new world where he could plot his return to power. The plan even included a daring pirate-led escape mission, a real-life high seas adventure that wouldn't fill out a place in a swashbuckling tale. But Napoleon never made it. He died before the plan could be realized, and Gerard's ghost is said to still linger in the house, waiting for the emperor who would never arrive. The history of the building didn't stop with its Napoleonic ambitions. During the Civil War, it was transformed into a hospital where the wounded and dying were cared for. Some say the spirits of that turbulent time still haunt this house, with the ghost of a Confederate soldier sometimes seen pacing the second floor, as if stuck in a time loop, his unfinished business anchoring him to the spot. By 1900, the Napoleon House had entered a new chapter as a grocery store, before eventually evolving into the beloved tavern it is today, thanks to Joseph Impostato. The current staff frequently report strange occurrences. Glasses have been known to move on their own, appearing back on the shelves after being put away for the night. Perhaps the spirits of former patrons reliving the reverie of the past, unwilling to let the party die. But the most famous ghost of the Napoleon House is a small, elderly woman who is often seen sweeping the second floor balcony. Many believe she's a member of the Impostato family, continuing her daily routine in the afterlife. She's a quiet, unassuming presence, but one that adds to the rich tapestry of spectral activity in the building. If you're looking for a spot where history, hauntings, and good food collide, Napoleon House delivers on all fronts. Whether it's the Creole cuisine, the legendary Pimm's Cup cocktail, or the possibility of sharing your meal with a ghostly figure, the atmosphere is intoxicating in more ways than one. Just be ready at last call. Some of the patrons may not be ready to leave, and they may have been hanging around for a lot longer than you. Let's talk about the Pharmacy Museum, which might seem like a quirky little stop at first. You know, the kind of place where you expect to see old-timey remedies, some ancient medical tools, and probably learn a fun fact about how leeches were once considered top-tier healthcare. But like all things in New Orleans, the story behind the Pharmacy Museum soon takes a turn. A dark, haunted turn. It began innocently enough in 1816 when Louis Joseph de Filho became the city's first licensed pharmacist. At the time, his pharmacy represented the cutting edge of medical care in New Orleans, a place where science and medicine were rapidly evolving to combat the diseases that plagued the city. The pharmacy, located in the heart of the French Quarter, was a beacon of progress in a city where folk remedies often coexisted with formal medical practices. De Philho's pharmacy was a place where patients could trust they were receiving legitimate medical treatments instead of the quackery that ran rampant in the 19th century. But the story takes a sinister twist after De Philho sold the pharmacy. Local legend suggests that the new owner, whose name is lost to history, was far from the upstanding medical professional that DeFillo had been. Instead, rumors swirled that the pharmacy became a house of horrors. The new owner allegedly used the building for grotesque experiments, particularly on enslaved women, subjecting them to unimaginable horrors using medical tools that would have been barbaric even by the 19th century standards. The experiments, some say, were intended to push the boundaries of medical knowledge, but at an unspeakable human cost. Whether out of cruelty or a perverse curiosity, these experiments left a dark stain on the building's history, one that is said to reverberate to this day. It's no wonder, then, that the Pharmacy Museum has a reputation for being haunted. The ghost of this mysterious, cruel pharmacist is said to linger in the building, unable to rest after the atrocities he committed. Visitors and staff alike have reported strange phenomena that they attribute to this malevolent spirit. Books fly off the shelves with no explanations. Or alarms go off spontaneously. 
It's as if the building itself remembers the dark history it has witnessed and is unable to shake the presence of those who suffered within its walls. But the pharmacist isn't the only ghost said to haunt the museum. The spirits of two children are also frequently reported. These children, according to legend, tragically died within the building, possibly from an illness or accident related to the pharmacy's operation. Their presence adds a layer of heartbreak to this eerie atmosphere. The visitors have reported hearing the soft sound of children's laughter or crying, only to turn around and find no one there. The children's spirit, although less malicious than the pharmacist, adds to the feeling that the pharmacy museum is a place where the past refuses to stay buried. For those with an interest in eerie medical history or the paranormal, the pharmacy museum is a must visit. The exhibits alone, which feature everything from antique medical instruments to old-fashioned remedies for yellow fever, are enough to send a chill down your spine. But for those willing to dig deeper, the museum offers a glimpse into a darker, more haunted side of New Orleans past. Just be prepared. This is the kind of place where things can get weird, fast, and where the line between history and the supernatural often blurs. By day, Jackson Square feels like the beating heart of the city, a haven for beignets, jazz buskers, and eager tourists snapping pictures of the towering St. Louis Cathedral. But once the sun dips low and the square's gates creak shut, its dark history seeps through the cobblestones, mingling with the humid night air. This isn't just a spot for artists and tarot card readers, but beneath its picturesque charm, Jackson Square has witnessed horrors that refused to stay buried. Back in 1721, this place was called Palace des Arms, a central gathering point for French colonists. People strolled here after mass, gossiping and trading goods beneath the shadow of the cathedral. But the square quickly became more than a community hub. It turned into a place of bloodshed, where power was enforced through public executions. In 1729, Jackson Square became the stage for one of its first recorded executions following the Natchez Revolt. When the Natchez tribe fought back against French encroachment on their land, wiping out settlers, the French retaliated with cruelty. A captured Natchez leader was dragged to the square and burned alive. A grim spectacle meant to remind everyone who was in charge. From then on, Jackson Square was no longer just a place of congregation. It was a place of fear. Then came the horror of the Samba Conspiracy in 1731. Samba Bambera, an enslaved man from Africa, led a daring plot to rise against the French. But when the conspiracy was uncovered, the punishment was as brutal as it was public. Samba and several others were sentenced to be broken on the will a nightmarish device that slowly shattered bones, leaving its victims in agonizing pain. One woman involved in the plot was hanged, her lifeless body left swinging as a warning to anyone considering rebellion. The square, once bustling with life, was now home to death on display. And it didn't stop there. In 1811, the German Coast Uprising, the largest slave revolt in U.S. history, was met with ruthless retribution. When the rebellion was crushed, three of the revolt's leaders were hanged in plain view in Jackson Square, and in a grisly act of terror, their heads were severed and mounted on pikes along the city's gate. New Orleans may have moved on, but the square never forgot. After the sun sets, the square becomes something else entirely. The breeze carries the soft rustling of leaves, or perhaps something more. Shadows flicker as the light dances with the darkness, and if you're paying attention, maybe you can catch a glimpse of the spirits of those who met their end here. Restless souls still lingering, trapped between past and present. Per Dagobert was more than just a priest. He was a New Orleans icon. Arriving in 1722, he became beloved in the French Quarter known for his warm demeanor, love of food, wine, and music, and a lively spirit that blended the sacred with the secular. 
He knew everyone's name, sang hymns with soul, and wasn't shy about raising a glass after mass. A true neighborhood dad, he embodied the city's mix of spirituality and reverie. But like all things in New Orleans, the good times had a dark side. In 1769, New Orleans found itself in the middle of a brutal political upheaval. Spain had recently taken control of the city from France, and the transition was not smooth. When a group of locals attempted to rebel against Spanish rule, Governor Alejandro Bloody O'Reilly, a man whose nickname gives away his methods, swiftly crushed the uprising. In a grim display of power, O'Reilly executed the rebel leaders and left their bodies to rot in the humid air on the levee, a gruesome warning to anyone who might think of resisting again. The scene was macabre, the bodies abandoned to decay under the oppressive Louisiana sun, and the families of the dead were left powerless, unable to give their loved ones a proper burial. That's when Pierre Dagobert stepped in. The families, heartbroken and desperate, turned to him for help, hoping the man known for his kindness and resilience could find a way to honor the dead. With O'Reilly's soldiers stationed all around, the task seemed impossible. But Dagobert wasn't one to back down, especially when it came to doing the right thing. On a dark and stormy night, when the rain and wind made visibility almost impossible, Dagobert saw his chance. Cloaked in the storm, he slipped past the guards, his voice carrying through the darkness as he sang the hauntingly beautiful Kerry Eliasan, the traditional plea for mercy. Somehow the guards never noticed him as he gathered the bodies and led a solemn secret procession to the church for a proper burial. It was an act of both bravery and defiance, and some say it was nothing short of a miracle. Whether the storm muffled the sound or divine intervention played a part, Pierre Dagobert pulled off one of the most daring and holy heists in the city's history. Pierre Dagobert passed away in 1776, but like many New Orleans legends, death didn't seem to slow him down. His spirit has been spotted around the city, especially in Pirate's Alley, where he's known to make his presence felt on rainy mornings. Locals and visitors alike have reported hearing his unmistakable singing voice, soft and distinct, drifting through the air as if carried by the wind. Some even claim to see more than just Dagobert's ghost. He's often accompanied by a full phantom funeral procession, the mournful figures marching alongside him in eerie silence. It's as if Dagobert continues his sacred duty, leading the dead to their final resting place long after his own time has passed. It's classic New Orleans, a city where the line between the living and the dead is always a bit blurred. After all, if you haven't witnessed a ghost funeral led by a singing priest in the rain, can you really say you've experienced the full essence of the French Quarter? In true New Orleans style, even the afterlife comes with a second line. Now it's time to talk about 1138 Royal Street, better known as the Laurel Reed Mansion. A place that looks like it could be the crown jewel of New Orleans' historic French Quarter. With its wrought iron balconies and charming flower baskets hanging over the streets below. It's easy to mistake this mansion for another piece of the city's storied past. But behind this picturesque exterior lies one of the darkest, most chilling stories of New Orleans history. This isn't just another haunted house. It's a place soaked in cruelty and unspeakable horror. The story begins in the 1830s with Madame Dauphine Lallerie, a wealthy socialite whose glamorous reputation concealed a far more sinister reality. By all appearances, Lallerie was the epitome of Southern elegance, throwing lavish parties attended by the city's elite. Her mansion was a hub of high society, filled with glittering chandeliers flowing wine, 
and the sound of laughter and music echoing down Royal Street. But what the guests didn't know, and no one could have imagined, was that the beneath the charm and finery, Larlerie was hiding a monstrous secret. The truth came to light in 1834 when a fire broke out at the mansion. As flames engulfed the building, neighbors rushed in to help, breaking down a locked door to the attic, and what they found inside was beyond anyone's worst nightmares. There, they uncovered a scene of horrific abuse, enslaved people who had been tortured and mutilated by Larlerie, some chained to walls, others subjected to grotesque medical experiments. The details of what they endured are still enough to turn stomachs nearly two centuries later. The few survivors of the fire were too far gone to be saved, and their suffering became the talk of the city. Word of Larlerie's brutality spread like wildfire, turning her from a celebrated socialite into the most hated woman in New Orleans overnight. Larlerie herself? She fled the city in the dead of night, escaping justice and disappearing from public life. But the mansion she left behind was never the same. The gruesome discovery sparked rumors of curses, and it didn't take long for the people to begin reporting strange phenomena. The tortured spirits of those enslaved souls, it seemed, never left the house. Locals began to whisper that the mansion was haunted with sightings of ghostly figures and chains and the echo of screams filtering through the walls at night. Objects moved on their own and an oppressive, chilling energy clung to the place like a dark cloud. The mansion's reputation as one of the most haunted places in America was born, and to this day, people swear it's cursed. Enter Nicolas Cage. Because of course, in 2007, the eccentric actor with a flair for the dramatic purchased the Larlerie Mansion, drawn to its dark history and gothic appeal. But only one of the most cursed homes in New Orleans comes with the price. Not long after moving in, Cage's fortune took a nosedive. He filed for bankruptcy and was forced to sell the mansion, adding his name to the long list of owners who couldn't seem to hold on to the property. Maybe it was bad luck, or maybe the curse of Larlerie's evil lingers stronger than anyone wants to admit. For fans of American Horror Story, the Larlerie mansion's grisly tale became a central focus of Season 3, Coven. Kathy Bates brought the infamous Madame Larlerie to life on screen, cementing her place in pop culture as one of history's most terrifying real-life villains. The show didn't sugarcoat the brutality, and while it took creative liberties, the core truth remained. Dauphine Larlerie was every bit as horrifying as the legend suggests. Thinking about visiting? Unfortunately, the Larlerie mansion is privately owned and the current owners have no interest in turning it into a tourist attraction. It's off limits to the public, and you won't be able to step inside for a tour of its macabre history. But that doesn't stop people from gathering outside, snapping photos, and trying to catch a glimpse of something otherworldly. Whether it's the flicker of a shadow in the window, or an inexplicable cold chill in the air, visitors often leave with more than just a photo. They leave with the sense that they were watched, that something within those walls is still very much alive. So while you can't go inside, or walk down Royal Street, and a glance up at the infamous house is more than enough to send shivers down your spine. In a city like New Orleans where the dead never quite rest, you have to wonder if the ghost of 1138 Royal Street are watching you too. If you're wandering the French Quarter and find yourself in front of Lafitte's blacksmith shop, you may think you stumbled upon the set of a pirate movie. With its weathered brick walls and old wooden beams, the place practically begs you to imagine swashbuckling scoundrels plotting their next big heist inside. And you wouldn't be too far off. Pirate vibes are part of the charm here. But what you'll really discover inside isn't just a theme park version of pirate life. Instead, you'll find one of the oldest bars in the United States, with centuries of history, ghostly lore, and a decent chance of running into Nicolas Cage. Because in New Orleans, Cage sightings are just part of the atmosphere. Built in the 1770s, Lafitte's blacksmith shop stands as one of the city's oldest surviving structures, and it has the vibe to prove it. The dim, candlelit interior transports you to another time. 
and the creaky floors and low ceilings feel like they've seen more than their fair share of secrets. According to legend, the building was once owned by none other than the infamous pirate Jean Lafitte. Lafitte was more than just a high sea scoundrel. He was a folk hero who helped defend New Orleans during the War of 1812, lending his pirate fleet to General Andrew Jackson in the Battle of New Orleans. And while there's some debate over whether Lafitte ever really ran his black market operations from this very spot, the legend persists. And let's face it, it makes for a much more exciting story. In true New Orleans fashion, this farmer pirate hangout is now a bar. Because if there's one thing pirates in the French Quarter have in common, it's a love of booze. Today, Lafitte's blacksmith shop is a favorite watering hole for both locals and tourists looking to drink where history oozes from the wall. The bar prides itself on its authenticity. It's cash only with no fancy cocktails, just strong drinks served in a setting that makes you feel like you stepped into the 18th century. Grab a seat at one of the rickety wooden tables, order a drink, and let the candlelight do its magic. But Lafitte's isn't just about its pirate history. It's also about ghosts. This is New Orleans after all. The most famous spirit said to haunt the bar is Jean Lafitte himself. He's been spotted lurking in the dark corners of the room, his spectral figure watching over his old stomping grounds like a shadowy guardian. Some say his ghost never left because he's still protecting some hidden treasure he left behind. Given that the place is only lit by flickering candles, it's hard not to imagine Lafitte slipping in and out of the shadows. Patrons have reported feeling an eerie presence or watching glimpses of a figure in the corner of their eye, only to turn and find nothing there. Others claim to have seen him more directly, dressed in his pirate garb, lingering in the back as if he's waiting for his next adventure. And for those looking for a little extra supernatural thrill, there's a little bonus ghost activity at Lafitte's. The bathroom mirror of all places has its own haunted reputation. Visitors who take selfies in the dimly lit bathroom often find they're not alone in the picture. Ghostly photo bombs are part of the experience here, with some patrons snapping a quick shot only to find an uninvited guest, a faint figure, a pair of glowing eyes, appearing in the reflection behind them. It's a ghost story with a modern twist, and it's just one more reason why Lafitte's blacksmith shop is not your average bar. Of course, this is just another layer of what makes Lafitte so quintessentially New Orleans. It's a mix of history, ghost lore, and that uncanny ability the city has to make the past feel alive in the present. So if you're looking for a place that captures the essence of New Orleans, a blend of pirate history, spooky legends, and a dash of celebrity oddity, Lafitte's Blacksmith Shop is a must stop. Grab a drink, snap a selfie, and keep an eye out for the ghost. You never know who or what might be joining you for a nightcap. Imagine you're wandering the vibrant streets of the French Quarter, taking in the wrought iron balconies, the pastel facades, and the lively energy of New Orleans. The air is thick with history, and every building seems to have a story to tell. But then you come across the Gardette La Petri Mansion, also known as the Sultan's Palace, a grand structure that seems to radiate mystery. At first glance, it seems like any other beautifully preserved piece of French Quarter architecture. Elegant, stately, with a touch of faded glamour. But the story behind it? It's far more true crime thriller than the name Sultan's Palace might suggest. Back in the mid-1800s, Jean-Baptiste Le Petri, a wealthy Creole man, owned the mansion but fell on hard times. Looking for a way to maintain his opulent lifestyle, he decided to rent the property out. Enter the mysterious tenant, a man who claimed to be the brother or nephew of the Sultan of Turkey. His arrival in New Orleans was shrouded in intrigue. No one knew much about him, except that he came with a large entourage, and from the moment he took up residence in the mansion, things started to get strange. The so-called Sultan and his entourage transformed the mansion into a palace of exotic excess. Lavish, opulent parties became the norm. Night after night, the mansion was filled with music, laughter, and a seemingly endless parade of guests. 
The Sultan's Palace, as it came to be known, was a hive of hedonistic reverie, complete with rumors of opium, indulgence, and debauchery. The windows were often shuttered, and outsiders couldn't help but speculate about what went on inside those walls. The neighborhood buzzed with gossip, as the French quarters want to do, but no one would have anticipated the gruesome events that were about to unfold. Then one morning, the wild parties came to an abrupt, horrifying end. The mansion was eerily silent. Neighbors grew suspicious, and when somebody finally forced their way in, they stumbled upon a scene straight out of a nightmare. Every person inside the house had been brutally murdered. Men, women, and servants alike, slaughtered in what must have been a bloodbath of unimaginable violence. The Sultan himself, his mutilated body was found buried in the courtyard, barely concealed in the dirt as if someone had hurriedly tried to hide the evidence. To this day, no one knows exactly what happened that night or who was responsible for the massacre. Was it pirates? A rival faction seeking revenge? A coup from within the Sultan's own entourage? The mystery remains unsolved and the story has grown darker with time. But that's not where the mansion's eerie history ends. In true New Orleans fashion, the legend of the Sultan's palace has evolved into one of the city's most haunted tales. Visitors and passerbys claim they can still hear the ghostly echoes of that fateful night. The faint sounds of music, cut short by the chilling screams of the victims. The wind seems to carry the remnants of a long-gone party, as if the mansion's walls are still trying to shake off the memory of that gruesome massacre. Those brave enough to linger outside at night have reported seeing shadowy figures in the windows or catching glimpses of fleeting apparitions on the balcony. Some even say that the Sultan himself, still wearing his traditional robes, can be seen pacing the mansion, as if trying to uncover the truth behind his own murder. But it doesn't stop there. Because why would it? In New Orleans? The mansion is also said to be haunted by the spirit of a Civil War soldier who wanders the halls of the home for reasons no one quite understands. Some believe he's a remnant of a time when the mansion served as a refuge during the war, but others think he's a separate, unrelated entity, just another ghost adding to the building's already heavy paranormal load. It's as if the mansion is a magnet for restless spirits, drawing in those with unfinished business. Today, the Sultan's Palace is privately owned and has been converted into luxury condos. So getting inside to see for yourself is impossible unless you know somebody with a key. But that doesn't stop tourists and locals from snapping photos of the mansion's exterior, hoping to catch something eerie in the background, a shadow in the window, a flicker of movement where there shouldn't be. The mansion looms over the street, still whispering its dark secrets to anyone who stops long enough to listen. So the next time you're wandering the French Quarter, take a moment to stand outside the Gardet Le Petri Mansion. You may not be able to step inside, but you can feel the weight of its haunted history pressing against you. And if you're lucky, or unlucky depending upon how you see it, you just might catch a glimpse of the Sultan himself, forever trapped in a palace that became his tomb. Pat O'Brien's is one of those quintessential New Orleans bars that feels like it's been around forever. Because, in many ways, it has. Since opening its doors in 1933, it has become synonymous with the city's boozy French Quarter charm, thanks in no small part to its famous hurricane cocktails and lively courtyard. But many patrons may not know as they sip their drinks beneath the twinkling lights, Pat O'Brien's is also home to some seriously spooky encounters. In a city where history and hauntings go hand in hand, it's no surprise that this iconic bar has more than a few ghost stories of its own. By day, Pat O'Brien's is a bustling hotspot, its outdoor fountain glistening in the courtyard and the sounds of dueling pianos filling the air. But after hours, when the crowds have dispersed and the bar is quiet, the atmosphere shifts. Employees who close up for the night have reported feeling watched like someone's eyes are on them, even when the place is completely empty. It's a sensation that's hard to shape, as the walls themselves are alive with the energy of all the people who have passed through them over the decades. And it's not just a feeling. 
Ghostly footsteps are a common occurrence, echoing through the darkened bar as if someone unseen is still walking the floors long after closing time. Then there's the furniture. Chairs that were neatly arranged at the end of the night have been found mysteriously moved over the next morning, sometimes scattered as though the bar has hosted an impromptu after-hour party of the spectral kind. No one is quite sure who, or what, moves them, but the phenomena happens often enough to leave employees unnerved. The piano bar too has its own share of ghostly activity. It's not unusual for staff to hear a single piano key plink in the dead of night, like a spirit offering a challenge, as if daring anyone to a ghostly piano duel. The haunting sound cuts through the silence, sending shivers down the spine of anyone unlucky enough to be on the receiving end. The keys are well worn from decades of performances, but there's something chilling about hearing one play when there's no human hands in sight. Perhaps the strangest, most mysterious phenomena happens on the fourth floor. Every night, a window on the Bourbon Street side of the building opens on its own, despite being firmly shut earlier in the evening. No matter how many times it's closed, no matter how securely it's latched, the next morning it's always wide open, as if someone or something wants to keep an eye on the bustling street below. Some say it's the spirit of a former tenant or perhaps a patron from the bar's earlier days who never quite checked out, content to keep the window open to let in the sounds of the quarter. But the most startling ghost encounter at Pat O'Brien's happens in the women's restroom. Over the years, numerous women have reported hearing footsteps behind them when they're alone, the soft sounds of dress sheets tapping against the towel floor. Some have even turned around to see a ghostly man standing nearby, politely offering them a towel. He's well dressed with an air of old fashioned hospitality, but before anyone can respond, he vanishes into thin air. The restroom attendant who isn't really there is one of the bar's most famous ghostly guests. And while his appearance is unsettling, it says he means no harm, just another spirit going about his business. All of this is what makes Pat O'Brien so quintessentially New Orleans. It's not just a bar, it's a piece of the city's living, breathing history. And like so many places in the French Quarter, the line between the living and the dead is blurry here. Next time you're at Pat O'Brien sipping on a hurricane or listening to the dueling pianos, take a moment to soak in the atmosphere. Because in a place this steeped in the past, the spirits in your glass may not be the only ones in the room. You never know who or what might be keeping you company. You're weaving your way through the chaos of Bourbon Street, sidestepping neon signs and drink specials being shouted from every doorway when you stumble upon the old Absinthe House, a time-worn, crumbling little bar that seems to stand still while the rest of the street swirls in a whirlwind of beads and booze. The moment you step inside, you feel like you've left the modern world behind. The bar's been around since 1752, and every inch of it feels soaked in history. And not just because of the countless absinthe drips that have stained the bar over the years. This place has stories, and like most old buildings in New Orleans, those stories come with a side of ghosts. Legend has it that in 1815, none other than Andrew Jackson and the infamous pirate Jean Lafitte met right here at the old absinthe house to plan the defense of New Orleans against the British invasion. Jackson, desperate for help in protecting the city during the War of 1812, struck a deal with Lafitte, who provided his pirate crew in exchange for a pardon. The unlikely partnership led to the victory at the Battle of New Orleans, and the old absinthe house was forever enshrined in local lore. But apparently, Lafitte enjoyed his time here so much, he decided to stick around permanently. His ghost, along with his rambunctious crew, is said to haunt the place to this day. Visitors have reported hearing ghostly laughter, the clinking of long empty glasses, and the faint sounds of his private party in full swing. It's like Lafitte and his men are still toasting their victory centuries later. 
But Lafitte isn't the only famous spirit rumored to wander through the old absent house. Andrew Jackson himself has also been spotted here, as of returning to live one of his most important moments of his life. Some patrons have reported seeing a tall figure in military garb standing at the bar, staring off into the distance before fading away. And then there's Marie Laveau, the legendary voodoo queen of New Orleans, who despite having had no known connection to the bar in life, is said to make the occasional ghostly appearance here. Maybe it's the absence that draws her back, or maybe it's the old abstinence house proximity to the spiritual undercurrent that runs through the city. But the list of ghostly visitors doesn't stop there. Union General Benjamin Butler is another spirit known to haunt the old absent house. He's been seen sitting quietly in a corner, as if thinking over strategy, his spectatorial presence still commanding respect, even in death. The old absent house, with its peeling paint, worn wooden beams, and the scent of centuries-old history, is the perfect spot for a spooky drink. The absinthe drifts slowly from the fountain creating an almost ritualistic vibe. And as you sit at the bar, you can't help but feel the presence of those who have come before you, both living and dead. The ghosts of pirates, generals, and voodoo queens swirl through the air, making the old absent house more than just another French Quarter bar. It's a place where the past feels close enough to touch and where even the afterlife seems to won't in on the party. So next time you find yourself on Bourbon Street seeking a break from the flashing lights and boisterous crowd, step into the old absinthe house. Order a drink, listen closely, and don't be surprised if you find yourself sharing the bar with someone or something from another time. Because in New Orleans, even the ghosts know how to have a good time. I want to personally thank you for watching this video. And here's what I want out of you. I want you to subscribe. I want you to follow. I want you to lock, hit that, smash that like button. And I want you to share this video far and wide. And remember, it's not goodbye. It's see you next week on Gulf Coastal Connections.